Every time I uh, take a group to Israel, one of the last days of the tour, I take my group down to an area known as the Judean Shephelah. Uh, now these are the low hills that stood behind the higher mountains of central Judah, places like Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Hebron, and the green coastal plains that sat next to the Mediterranean Sea. In the early years of the history of the nation of Israel, the Hebrews came to occupy and control the mountain areas. And a group of people who came to the area by sea, the Philistines, had gained control of the coastal plains. These Philistines were not only well-organized warriors, but they possessed the groundbreaking technology of iron smelting, making their weapons and armor vastly superior to the bronze weapons the Israelites had access to. An iron sword can cut a bronze sword in half with the right, in the right hands. They also possessed something that the Israelites didn't, chariots, which honestly were the F-16s of their day. So you can imagine what a huge advantage this gave them. In fact, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, many people believe that the Philistines may possibly have been part of the, the people who were displaced from Troy in the famous Trojan War. There were all sorts of people movements then moving around the Mediterranean and down, and that's, that's at least a, a tantalizing prospect. Now, these foothills then became the main battleground between the Israelites and the Philistines. It was here that they fought over both land to live on and important trade routes that were a lifeline of goods and wealth. If Israel was to grow and prosper in the land that God had guided them to, eventually they'd have to gain control of these territories and find a way to defeat the better armed and better organized Philistines when they attacked Jewish territory. So what I do is I always take our groups up to a hilltop overlooking the Valley of Elah. And then I, I set this scene. I say, yeah, have you ever heard about the Battle of David and Goliath? Well, over there on that small hill, that's where the Israelites were camped. And over there on that hill, that's where the Philistines were camped. Down in that valley there, that, that's where Goliath came down every day to challenge the Israelites. Uh, up there on that distant mountain ridge, uh, up there, that's the town of Bethlehem. So where David lived and where he came from when he came to the camp. Down there, you see that stream. Well, that's where he got his five smooth stones. And that flat part of the valley there must be where they fought. Now, now let me tell you, uh, you don't need to say much more than that. Suddenly, this Sunday school story becomes alive in your mind as you overlook the place where it occurred. And you see actually how all the pieces fit together. We were looking down on a place where probably the best known man-to-man -man fight of all human history took place. The Valley of Elah. David versus Goliath. Now it's interesting to see how each side saw the challenge that faced them. It's a long scripture. I'm trying to keep the sermon shorter, so I'm not going to read the whole story today. Uh, but I do want you to look at how each side saw this challenge and therefore saw this battle. Goliath sees this simply as an issue between him and the men who followed the king of Israel, Saul. To him, it was simply a man-to-man -man struggle. 1 Samuel 17:8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why don't you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. Now, of course, you know, that was to his advantage. No one was bigger or stronger than him. And so, what you think about it in pure human terms, well, that, that gives him an enormous advantage. Plus, the reality is, when you think about it, it was probably a ploy to try to get the Israelites to come down off their hill and fight on the valley floor where the Philistines could then annihilate them with their chariots. Now, obviously, at this point, most Israelites saw the challenge in much the same way. No single person with his own strength was even close to being Goliath's equal. And it was humiliating to have one man come out and taunt you day after day. You could probably hear the howls of laughter and the insults that came from the Philistine camp when Goliath strode into the valley and found no one uh, willing to uh, answer his challenge. Uh, and, but, you know, frankly, no one was interested in committing suicide by leaving the protection of the, their camp on the hill and going down to fight him. But one person saw this as a different kind of challenge. It wasn't about size or strength or weapons or even fighting ability. It was about trust. It was about faith. It was about God. 
Young David, the shepherd boy who was left at home to watch the sheep while his brothers went to the battle lines, is sent by his father to bring food down to his brothers. He hikes the 20-mile lines down the ridge from Bethlehem uh, to bring them the food. And as he arrives there, he sees this humiliating standoff. And immediately he sees this not as a flesh and blood challenge, but as a test of their faith in their God. 1726, David asked the men standing near him, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, now what happens next, and I love how the Bible is so honest, is almost a comedy. The men are deeply humiliated by David's comments, but still no one is willing to take up Goliath's challenge. Well, David says he's, gonna, he's willing to do it with God's help. So a little hard to argue with that. So they decide to give him the only real set of metal armor they have. That's Saul's. But it's so big that when they put it on, David can't even walk in it. So he has to take it off. So he heads off with only a shepherd's sling and a staff, making a wide loop just to the north of the hill. And he stops in the shallow stream bed to pick up five rocks. By the way, I have to tell you, So many pilgrims go down to that stream bed now to pick up five rocks. Every three or four years, the Israeli Antiquities Department brings in a dump truck of rocks, (laughs) spreads them out along the stream bed. So there's something there there for people to pick up. Now, Now, let me tell you, to be fair to David, a sling is a serious weapon. A sling stone ranged from two to four inches in diameter. The stone traveled at only 60 miles per hour when released. Good slingers could hold openings in armor. And imagine how good a young man who, when watching sheep, had, all, had years of all day to practice this art. And by the way, slingers were actually a big part of ancient war. Even in Judges, which is, you know, comes a couple hundred years before, we read in Judges, and the people of Benjamin had mustered out of their cities that day 2,600 men who drew the sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah who mustered 700 chosen men. Then verse 16, among these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, Everyone who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. So slings were serious weapons back then. Even now they are. If you've ever had someone sling a stone at you. And yet again, when David meets Goliath face to face, he casts the battle not as a human conflict, not as a test of weapons, but as a conflict of faith and trust in the God of Israel. Again, 17, 25, and 46. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you has defied. Then verse 46, this day the Lord will hand you over to me, and the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel. Now you know how the story ends. And you know, most of the time these days we read the story as a victory of the little guy over the big guy, the, the weak uh, and the brave over the strong and the arrogant, and that, there's a lot of appeal in that. But that's not the point the story makes. What it is, most of all, is a story of someone who trusted God. It's a story of someone who puts his faith into actions. Now, you know, friends, words are cheap when we're not under pressure. It's easy to say that God is a great and powerful God when we don't have to put our life on the line. But ultimately, the reason that ultimately David makes such a great king and a man of God is not so much his physical ability, or his good judgment, nor his leadership, nor even his moral character. Let's face it, friends, if you know the story of David, honestly, you see David fail miserably in those areas any number of times. What we do find is that David can trust God even when it doesn't seem to make sense to do so. Every Israelite on that hill that day would have told you that he trusted and served God, but only one of them walked down the hill and put his actions where his mouth was. Now, most of us will never have to physically fight anyone for God. In fact, I have to say that in most circumstances these days, it's not fighting that shows that we are controlled by a higher power. But all of us every day have opportunities to prove that our faith isn't just words we mindlessly mutter on Sunday mornings or in Facebook postings and then ignore during the rest of the week. And while we are saved only by grace, ultimately it is what we do that shows that that grace is real. And whether, or whether we're just along for the ride until things get bumpy. Now, I always like to tell you what, what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that in every circumstance, 
um, you need to take some radical path that demonstrates what you believe. And, and you find people who take this to the extreme. There is a time and a place for everything, and there are good options and bad options. And you need to, to separate the two. I remember years ago, I was at a youth conference uh, sponsored by the church at a, at a hotel in, um, in Dallas. And, and literally just across the street from a hotel uh, was a strip club. <laughs> and every night there would be a whole line of motorcycles lined up in front of it. And I, I had a roommate, I just kind of randomly aside one day, night we were talking. He was very, I would say, he was very on fire for his faith. And he says, you know what? We have time. Let's go over there and, and witness to everybody. Now, friends, I love Jesus, <laughs> but there is a time and a place for everything, and I like my nose unbroken. Um, <laughs> still, you know, life is full of ways. We, we show whether our own personal faith in Jesus Christ is what guides us, or, or whether we allow the ebb and the tide of human affairs to determine what we do and how we act. Every time you have the opportunity to show compassion, that's a test of your faith. Every time you are tempted to cheat or lie, that's a test of your faith. Every time you're faced with a moral dilemma, that's a test of your faith. Every time you're faced with some important decision, well, that's a time for you to consider if you really mean what you say about trusting God. And friends, I know there are times in life when we would rather walk down a Judean hill with a slingshot in our hand and a giant in the valley than face some modern personal challenge that lies before us. And you know, friends, most of life's greatest challenges aren't very dramatic for others to watch, but they're very real for us. And how we meet them determines much about who we are and who we will be. That's when trust comes into play and ultimately shows us what we really believe. Let me close with a final story this morning. I know I've said this, used this before, but it fits. Uh, Charles Blondin was, was known as the great Blondini. He was a famous tightrope walker in the mid-1800s. Um, outstanding uh, were some of the incredibly hazard feats he performed were at exhibitions that he arranged. Uh, notably, in 1859 and 1860, on an 1,100-foot-long tightrope stretched 160 feet across Niagara Falls. And, and Blondini varied his act. I mean, the first time he did it, he simply walked across with a pole, and, and then he crossed... Uh, Blindfolded, he crossed it once while pushing a wheelbarrow. He did it once while balancing on stilts. One time he even took a table and a small stove and he cooked himself breakfast and ate it while he was out there. On one occasion in, in 1858, uh, with thousands of people gathered to see this feat, he actually planned to take a volunteer from the crowd on his back and walk across the thing. His manager, Harry Col Colcord, uh, had encouraged Blondin to do the act, and he actually arranged for a volunteer to come forward uh, to do so. At the last minute, the volunteer backed out. So Blondin went before the crowd, and he asked those assembled there if they thought he could do this amazing feat of carrying somebody across there. Well, of course, you know, there was a thunderous cheer of yes. And then he asked for a volunteer to come down and climb on his back. And nobody came forward. How will you answer when someone asks you if you truly believe? What will you do when the challenge comes to you? Let me finish with a final thought this morning. And I say this mostly for you folks at home. I completely understand that for many people, this is not the time to come back to in-person worship. In fact, I'll be honest, if all of you did, we couldn't probably fit you in. And I know that even when the restrictions are lifted, that some folks are going to want to wait a while before they resume all of their post-COVID activities, including coming to church and many other areas of their life. But I will tell you that pretty much every church pundit who's, who's written about it agrees that when this quarantine period is over, there are going to be a lot of people who used to come to worship every Sunday morning who are not going to come back. And a lot of people who are not going to renew their participation in the life and the activity of their church. Guesses range between 20 and 30 percent. Apparently one denomination is quietly planning for about one-third of their congregations to close. These numbers are just guesses, but my gut tells me they are at least close to right. 
And maybe this will be our big test of putting our faith into action. Will this generation say God is the most important thing in our life and the body of Christ is so critical to the mission of God's people and the earthly glory of God and then come roaring back into church when the time is right? Or will we fail at what perhaps will be the greatest earthly test of what we really believe? And I encourage you to start deciding now how you will answer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. For, Lord, we know that only by his life-giving sacrifice do we have faith. Can we come to you at all? But, Lord, we want that faith to be real. We want to do our part, guided and enabled by your Holy Spirit, to live for you in each and every part of our life. When challenges come, let us not forgive you. When decisions have to be made, let us trust your word. When we need to go forward, let us not stand still. And Father, may we trust Jesus Christ in each and every place and each and every way that you call us to in the life that you've given us. For we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, as you come to the Lord's Supper, it, um, it really is one of these great places where you, you think about trust. You think about the original disciples and what they had to go through. And as they gathered at this table that they thought would be maybe this great celebration of Jesus' coming in power. And, and Jesus sits there and tells them something that they can't even comprehend. That everything that you think is supposed to happen that makes sense is going to go the other way. And I'm going to be arrested and tortured and killed. And that God's ultimate good is going to be happening for that. And you just have to trust and act and believe. And so every time we come to this table, we're reminded that God calls us to trust and act and believe because God, in Jesus Christ, trusted and he acted and he believed and sacrificed himself for us. And you know what? In the end, it's working out pretty good. So we gather at this table and we remember God's great provision, first in the Passover, but only as it is focused in Jesus Christ. When he brought them to the table and he took bread and he broke it and he passed it around and he gave it a new meaning and he said, this is my body, just given for you. Do this remembering me. And in the same manner, after supper, he takes the fourth cup that's passed around and gives it a new meaning and said, this cup is a new covenant poured out in my blood, poured out for the remission of sin. Do this also remembering me. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let us pray. Father, thank you for the great reminders that you bring to us at this table of the love that surpassed our own fallenness, that caused you to send your son to earth, to live a sinless life, to die an unjust death, to stand in our place and take a sin upon our shoulders, that we might have forgiveness and new life. Set aside and bless these very simple elements that come to us in, in almost a strange way, but remind us of your body broken and your blood shed, that we might be reminded of the depth and the power of your love for us and your call to serve you in each and every place. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take off the, uh, the waiver. Friends, this is the body of Christ. Let us share the bread. And if you would uncover the cup. You know, Jesus said, I am the vine. And those who believe in me uh, will never thirst. Let us share the cup. Well, Father, with a grateful heart, we thank you that you have called us from death back to new life. 
life in you, life in Jesus Christ, and have reminded us of the great sacrifice that changes everything. Let us be strengthened by our time at this table. Let us go out into the world remembering who you are and what you've done. Let us consider the people of faith that have gone before us, that great cloud of witnesses that guides us in our own courage and boldness to serve and love you. And let us go from this place excited to be the people that you have called us to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Friends, go from this place and and do one thing well. Trust Jesus. Because that covers everything. And may his grace, his mercy, his peace, and the abundance of his blessing be with you now and forevermore. Amen. And thank you.